Yo, Can't for a second? No. I want to get his jacket. Can you just stand up for a second?
Who said broadcasting? Who said it first? <laughs> you want to broadcast? Whoa! Wow! Now, now they'll be fighting over all right? I can't recall who was first. Uh, you guys are guitar players, aren't you? Oh, yeah. You play nines? This is uh, all I got. Yeah, I play nines. He does now. He does now. He, does now. he, does now. he, does now. he just switched. <laughs> Okay, the broadcaster was the correct answer to that. And Fender, I hope you can all hear me when, when I step away from here. I'm going to try to talk as loudly as possible. Because I'm going to be switching guitars and, and doing all sorts of things. The broadcaster... The broadcaster... When it came out, it had what was called the, the old butterscotch blonde look to it, and it had a black, big white pig guard. Fender still makes that guitar. It became known as the Telecaster several years later. Uh, what, what made that instrument so special was not only for the reason was it Fender's very first electric solid body guitar, but it was the very first electric solid body guitar ever put into production. And uh, before this time period, when, when the broadcaster came out, you had to play either an acoustic guitar with a pickup on it, or actually try to mic the thing. And even at 1948 sound pressure levels, when it first came out, uh, that was a hard chore to cover. In fact, you were usually uh, reduced to, not that it's a lower job or anything, but you could only comp, because it was too hard for the electric guitars to be able to pull out in front of the band, even at 48 volumes, uh, and, and lead the band or, or front the band playing a lead solo. So electric guitar solos was pretty much restricted to recording situations at the time. So you hear uh, people like Django Reinhardt and Charlie Christian playing along in, in the 30s and, and stuff, but when those guys were out with the big bands, there was no way they were going to be able to solo out in front of the band. Big bands, anybody ever seen a big band live? They get pretty loud, you, you, louder than you think they, they get. So uh, the guitarist was stuck to basically comping only and not being able to do any soloing. When the broadcaster came out, being that it was a solid body electric guitar, what they called at the time solid body electric Spanish guitar, whatever Spanish had to do with anything, you know. But uh, this, this was the very first of any electric solid body guitars put in production. You had these problems with an acoustic guitar at the time, and it's even more augmented these days if you were to try to play acoustic guitar uh, on, a, on a gig, especially if the band's fairly loud. One of the re, uh, things is, well, place yourself back in the mindset of 1948. You bring your powerful 12 watt amplifier with you. <laughs> there wasn't twins back then, you know, and 100 watt stacks and things like that. So you bring your powerful 10, 15 watt amplifier, which was was definitely smoking jack you know, at the time. <laughs> and, and secondly, you get up to a certain volume, and you get uh, it starting to feed back, and you know, so you have to back it down or take off the, uh, no, they didn't even have any EQ on them, a tone knob, right? So you were stuck. So you didn't uh, go, go over to your graphic EQ or parametric and, I mean, the times have definitely changed. But you're playing and you have this hard time with, with the, the guitar feeding back. And even if it wasn't and you placed it in the right area where, where it was faced away from you and maybe towards the front of the stage. You'd have this problem of, because you get over four or five and you get this god-awful stuff some people call distortion, you know. And of course you wouldn't want any of that in your guitar playing. <laughs> Boy, have the times changed, right? Why would you want your guitar, I remember this one guy, old geezer, asking me, why would you want your guitar to sound like your speakers were blown? Why would you buy this little box, you know? <laughs> So nowadays we've been, become connoisseurs of distortion, right? One guy might say, oh, I love that 
that uh, clean lead type of tone where it's got a bump in the mid range and, and you pick it lightly and it's clean and you hit it hard and it kind of snarls like Elvis's lip. <laughs> or maybe uh, another guy in the audience might say, nah, nah, nah. That isn't a good distortion sound. I like the chainsaw effect. <laughs> you, know, you probably heard all the jokes. You know. What's the difference between a chainsaw and a electric guitar? You know. Chainsaw is more dynamics, things like that. You know. <laughs> I, I am the object, of the brunt of all these jokes. You know, um, this guy upstairs who happens to be a keyboard player tells me all these, you know, how do you get a guitarist to turn down, you know, put a chart in front of him. <laughs> so, it got real funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this type of thing. So anyway, the guitarist, once they had a solid body electric guitar, all of a sudden there was no squealing and feedback problems. And now, all, all of a sudden, came the requirement for more powerful guitar amplifiers. So, Fender came out with the, some amps like 20 watts, 25 watts, and for a while that was kind of holding. Those amps got pretty loud, too, which later became like the Deluxe Reverb, you know, the early Deluxes and the, uh, the Dual Professional, and all this type of stuff. Yes? Is it still Michael on that? No. Uh, but that will leak, you know, way. Uh, Fender is is now doing some vintage reissue amplifiers. One of which is over here, and that's one of the most highly sought after amplifiers called the old 410 Basement. Did they have a Pro Reverb though? They had a Pro Reverb, yeah, 115 model, 40 watts, yeah. <coughs> we don't have enough to show. No. Maybe, maybe we can get around and do that. Let's see how it goes. Uh, because of Fender in the last, shoot, the last seven or eight years coming out with vintage reissued guitars, uh, we started to hear that people were asking, well, you have vintage reissued guitars, have you ever thought about having old tweed amps and resurrecting some of those? And it seemed like the time was right, and it, it finally has come about. That has the same signal path as the old ones. And in fact, we even got uh, Alnico V mag, uh, the old Alnico horseshoe magnets. And, and I mean, we've done everything humanly possible. Now, s this is not necessarily for the guy who says he looks it over and goes, "Huh, where's the channel switching? Or where's my effects loop? Or where's my digital reverb? Or or anything like that?" This is the way it was. In fact, uh, any of you guys ever seen Spinal Tap? You know, remember <laughs> Nigel? Nigel Tufnell. <laughs> no, I'm making a point though. Nigel Tufnell, you know, he had his amplifier that went to 11. Okay, these were made way before, and these go to 12. <laughs> so, so uh, Leo Finn, pardon? <laughs> yeah. He says, "Well, ours go to 11." Anyway, Leo Fender's. Uh, this is a 59 replica of a 59 basement, and that goes up to 12. So, uh, if, you, if you remember Spinal Tap, that was great. Okay, we have so much to cover, and like I say, I'm going to go off of questions. Yes? What happened to Leo Fender? What happened to Leo? Is he still with Fender? No. He, he, he is he's still alive, and uh, he wasn't looking too well last time. Uh, Larry and I saw him in January at the NAMM show. He's definitely getting up there. He had had a stroke last year. He left the business in 1965. He put the, the company up for sale in late 64. He was, his doctor told him that he didn't have long to live and that's why he got out of the business in the first place. And so I think he wanted to <coughs> smell the roses. I would if I was told that. You know. So. Uh, he recovered from his illness and got antsy and, and was a workhorse, so he he has GML guitars and uh, for a, a short while was involved with music in as well, back in 75, uh, 76, and by about the end of 76 he was gone from there too and uh, started GML with George Fullerton. And, uh, 
and uh, that's what happened on that. Uh, we have a lot of respect for him. If there was no Leo Fender, there wouldn't be any Fender, and we wouldn't all be here tonight. We wouldn't all be here tonight. <laughs> and I wouldn't be doing this, this wonderful job that, that I have of uh, showing off some guitars that I have uh, not only fallen in love with, but have been playing for the last 10 years uh, exclusively Strata, Strata Gas Music. Now we have different variations that have evolved since then, and I'm going to try to do them justice and show you some of them tonight, introduce you to them, and amplifies as well. Like I say, this is kind of a hefty task because I like each night to be different, and each night there's a different crowd and different interests, different questions and everything, and it's, it's always a, a nice challenge. So, um, okay, let me ask you another question. Uh, you excluded, and you excluded. At least give these guys the right of first refusal. How about that? Who happens to know what the very next Fender electric guitar was? And don't say Esquire. Who said Stratocaster over here? Nobody did. Huh? <laughs> I did. I did. I did. I did. I did. I did. <laughs> well, you're wrong. No. It was the Stratocaster. Okay, let me let me ask you this. What was the first year it came out? Fifty-three, I believe. Fifty-four was the correct answer. Um, do you have this book? Yes, I do. You do. <laughs> then I'll have to give you the uh, the broadcast. Here's a set of strings. The Stratocaster was very, the very next one. And that was 1954, which was the correct answer. Developed in 53, came out in 54. Uh, let me grab something a little more traditional. What made the Stratocaster so unique? Yeah, because they're breaking them off, right? The Stratocaster, when this thing came out, uh, the other manufacturers that, that existed at the time, which were far fewer than, than they are these days, said, man, this is so space age. Who's going to ever like this one? You know, this is, They've gone too far this time. They're going to fall on their face on this one. And luckily, Fender didn't. But it had a lot of new, innovative ideas. And the Stratocaster basically has, uh, has been enjoying incredible success <laughs> ever since it was released. About 1966, there was a point where it had dropped off in sales. And, uh, and they were considering discontinuing that, and the Telecaster at the time. And that's when Jimi Hendrix came out, and, and, and the sales just soared once again and have never let up since. In fact, it, it's, it's got to be the, the, if not one of the, uh, all-time bestsellers, the all-time most duplicated and best-selling guitars ever. Um, it was the first saw-body electric guitar to have three single coils. Fender was the first to ever put out these, the body contours. And those of you that like beer, you'll find it. <laughs> after a while, okay? And you can still see the strings, too. And so <laughs> uh, and this has become quite a standard among a lot of most all uh, electric saw body guitars. Another thing that was really original and made this really unique was, was this type of trim system, which is still copied today. And uh, what made it different than the earlier Bigsby tailpiece, which was, it was uh, the, the Bigsby tailpiece was a separate trim system and a separate bridge that rested on the face of the guitar. This was the first one to ever have the bridge saddles, the trim plate, and the trim block all as one pivoting uh, type of apparatus. If you think about it, uh, Schaller, or who makes trim systems as well, and, and um, Floyd Rose, and, and all the, the various spin offs of locking. Kaler, all work off of this principle. They just lock it down, obviously, but, but it's still the same principle of a knife edge pivot type of motion. So the Stratocaster has been probably the most widely duplicated, ripped off, mimicked, and cloned in 
they're all listed. What I'd like to do now is move in increments away from vintage, from the vintage Stratocaster. I mean, history is all well and good, but what's Fender doing nowadays, right? So, as we move in, in, in steps away from vintage, you're going to see some things that get a bit more radical. And I know there are things somewhere in there that, that will fit your liking. For a guitar lover like me, they'll all fit your liking. You want to buy them all. I keep telling my wife, no, it's on my sample account. I didn't buy it. <laughs> After three months, it's like, how come you haven't turned that in yet? Because <laughs> we own it. I don't say we bought it, we own it. It's a same thing. It sounds nice, right? It's a selling technique. It's an investment. It's our new investment opportunity. <laughs> okay. The American Standard Stratocaster is the first one away from vintage. What makes this so different, you might look at it and you go, well, it looks like a strap. Big deal. What, what is different about this guitar are many little things that, that are all rolled into one that, uh, that won this the most innovative guitar award at the 86 NAMM show. If, uh, okay, if you go back five years, how many guys have been playing over five years? Great, season players. Uh, seven years? Ten years? <laughs> I won't embarrass you. <laughs> okay, you go back five, ten years with me, and if you were like me, which you aren't necessarily, but uh, being a guitarist, I, I feel I had a lot of the same problems as a lot of people. What I would do was I'd buy a new Stratocaster, and then I'd immediately have the, the frets ripped off, and I'd put larger, have larger frets placed on it, and then I'd have shallower tuners put on it. And then maybe I'd have them just take some of the finish off so it didn't feel sticky and this type of thing. Just little little things here and there. And uh, <coughs> this guitar has that and a lot more. Uh, it comes standard with shallower tuners. Instead of lacquer, it's a satin polyurethane finish and it doesn't tend to get sticky. It feels more like a chalk pool cue. And if you ever, I know it doesn't happen around here, but if you ever live in an area that gets real humid, in the summer. <laughs> You'll appreciate this type of finish on a neck. And instead of the seven and a quarter inch radius fretboard, you took a seven and a quarter inch circle and laid it over this width, you'd have a seven and a quarter inch radius. If you were to have an old vintage fender, it was seven and a quarter inch, whether it was a P bass, jazz bass. Stratocaster, Jazzmaster, Telecaster, whatever it was, that was the radius that was used on all the necks. Well, this guitar is a nine and a half inch radius, which means that it, it's a slightly flatter radius. It's slight enough to not feel much different than the seven and a quarter inch, so it still feels very Fender-esque and, and more like a vintage. But what what it is basically. Uh, done for is so that you can lower the string action. Over the last 10-15 years, it's been very m much more in vogue to have the string action lower and lower and lower and lighter and lighter strings and this type of thing. So this allows you to lower your string action so you don't fret out or buzz out as you bend uh, a wild string bend over the fret radius and then choke out like you know, some if you've noticed, if you've ever got your string action too low, it kind of goes, uh, like you stopped it there, but you're going, eh. this type of thing. So you have to back it off and bring it up just a little more and find out where, where it's at. This allows you to do it much lower. This also has a, a nice large fret that's added on instead of the small little skinny vintage frets. And it's pretty much, it's, it's got me spoiled. A 20-second fret. It, it's weird going back to a vintage guitar now, and, and I really like vintage guitars, but um, this is much more, I think, a meat and potatoes type of guitar. It really does uh, <coughs> play great. 20-second fret added, and uh, maybe you'll appreciate this. I did. Uh, this 
place is too grounded out too well. I'm not getting any noise. You guys that have been around a long time you probably notched it out of your, your memory in advance. <laughs> because you know you might have this going on and then the rest of the band going is going. I don't know. Sounds like some of you guys have been, been through that kind of situation. <laughs> so, <laughs> consequently, they start turning things off one at a time. The drummer goes, well, I don't have anything to do with that. <laughs> the bass player turns his, his instrument off, and, and it might lighten up a little, it might not change it at all. Maybe he's lying in, I don't know. Synth player, obviously nothing. And there's still all of this going on, right? So the guitar says, well, it's not... <laughs> How'd that get good, you know? Like, like it's some revelation, right? You've been living with it for years, but you're acting like it's some new thing. You're going, gosh, so far with this building. Well, that is the sound of, of how susceptible single coils are, uh, pickups. That's why in, in the late 50s, uh, a guy by the name of Seth Lover came up with the humbucking pickup, which had a reverse wound, reverse polarity on it and it, it took away all the noise. But along with it, it changed the sound. It was, a, it was a, a pleasing sound, but it was a whole different sound than the single coil sound. So either you had this richer, thicker, warm, warm tone and had no buzz, or if you insisted on having a single coil sound, you had to live like that. Okay, with this guitar, what Fender has done to change that a little bit, like I said, we're, we're only the first step away from vintage, is they reverse the center coil and reverse the polarity so that when you're in position two or four, you lose that hum. So it's getting quite like, like a whole And you still have that out of phase tone that Clapton made so popular. <laughs> steel bridge saddle, bridge saddles that are made out of stainless steel, uh, steel and then powder coated so they are a much harder substance than the earlier steel rolled ones that, that tend to pit and form burrs that creates premature string break breakage. So this is a definitely a, for somebody who wants all these little things but wants kind of a vintage looking Stratocaster, uh, something like a Robert Cray. Uh, You'll like this one. In fact, I'll do a team with this guitar right now. In fact, I'll do a team with this.
they're so different that they're, they're very complementary to each other and you can get all sorts of different sounds. But with the front pickup, you've got all the mellow type of tones.
Now, what makes this one different from the uh, the Strat Plus, the American, I'm sorry, the American uh, standard Telecaster is that it's it's got uh, two lay sensor, uh, three lay sensor pickups on it. Now, lay sensors. Um, I'm going to get into that in a second. I'm just going to play this one and we'll just do a little more playing and, and then I'll, I'll talk about it because I'm going to go to this guitar next and, and we'll kind of tie it all together. <laughs>
And if you've seen Beck for the last two years, he's been using Strap Plus. And two years before that, he was using American Standard. He was using uh, what Fender put out at the time called Graffiti Yellow. And back in, in, in England, they were starting to call it Jeff Beck Yellow because he was the only guy who, who was using it. And he can use anything he wants, but that created a, a big demand for yellow Stratocasters over, overseas. <laughs> overseas, like <laughs> And another thing that's nice on the, the Strat Plus, okay, now we're the second increment away from vintage. We have the American Standard, now we have the Strat Plus. So what's different from the American Standard is, is the, the lace sensors and a locking trim system. Now it's not locking here and here, but it locks in the string post itself. You know, when, when, when uh, people were having a hard time when they were doing dive bombs and starting to get into that, like in the early 70s, they wanted a trim system that stayed in tune. They didn't say, you know, this drill some holes through my neck here and clamp it here and you know, maybe I can cut the ball end off the string and bring a tool belt with me and, and all this type of thing. Um, basically this type of trim system stays in great tune without having to do all that. Now I'm not saying that it's going to take the place or even should even attempt to take the place of a Floyd Rose type of trim system. I consider guitars in three main categories. Uh, electric guitar says. Maybe this extreme over here is a guy who likes a Les Paul or a Telly or a 335 or a Strat that he blocks up. In other words, he doesn't play the trim system at all. He, he doesn't even wind it up. You know. <laughs> he leaves it in the case and it's, the threads probably look brand new on it and he's, he's never used it. And then you get over on this side and here's a guy who's made a fine art out of playing like a Floyd Rose or a Kaler type of locking trim system and wouldn't even think of going on stage without it. But both of these two areas at, uh, together don't even make up the guitarists in the middle that still have never even made up their mind about the whole thing. And maybe some of these guys and gals have tried it and they went down on a dive bomb and they come back up and they sound like... <laughs> And they, so they go down a hero and come up looking like a fool, right? And maybe some of these other guys, they, they've been playing on, on gigs and they didn't like all the rituals involved. So they, they kind of shined it on and they didn't like the learning curve that you had to go through on, on, on working it all out. Yes? I have a question. Uh, about five years ago I saw Johnny Winter and he was playing a Fender Strat with a bar on it. He fell on stage. I mean, right on top of the guitar. It was the stage, the bar, the guitar, and he got up and tuned. So, was there any way to electronically tune the guitar or something? And he was on fire. He was. I mean, he fell. Right it had to be done with a player. Where was that concert? I don't know. I saw that. Did you see him? He fell he right on top. Really? He, really? he was on the monitor. He landed right to the bar. He really? The bar go like almost collapsed. You could hear the bar collapse. <laughs> He was in Tim. Well, there have been guys in the past that have, have, have learned every little bit of, of the inertia and everything, gotten into this, this whole thing, and and with with their, I mean, you know, you've got an Eric Johnson type of guy, you know, that knows exactly how many wraps on which string post, and he's, I mean, he spends all this type of hours, supposedly you can tell the difference between an Ever Ready and a Mallory and all this type of stuff. But anyway, he, Plus, with you know each each groove of, of the uh, the bridge, you know, using some some soft you know graphite from a pencil, and that takes a lot of the friction away. And find a way to dispense of, of the string trees, but he, he knows exactly how many winds on his B and high E string and this type of thing. Uh, a lot of us we might as persnickety as we get. I haven't seen anybody as persnickety as Eric. And. Uh, I mean, that's, that's good, and, no, Buzzy Feet is another person that we, uh, but these guys, uh, for the average player, or the average great player that just is interested in going out and pulling it out and, and playing it, they don't have the time for that, and uh, so it was kind of out of most people's realm to, to be able to use the standard whammy bar and come back in tune, it'd be sound. 
you know, whoa, I hate, I hate guitarists. Man, why do you have to take that? You ever seen that face? You know, that disgusting look for the drummer, you know. <laughs> Along with that, um, these days you have synths, obviously, and they're so dead on accurate, it really sticks out like a sore thumb when you're out of tune. Before, you'd be in a guitar band with another guitar, or maybe it was a guitar, bass, and drums only, and there's nobody in your same register, like say Hendrix, a lot of times was, was out of tune here and there, and he'd just be tuning, he's going along, and it didn't grate against you than having someone who's literally playing dead on chords and this type of thing. And it really, really is more important now than, than ever to be in tune and, and really in tune and, and conscious of it. Well, this guitar basically is geared for these guys here uh, in the, the center that have never quite made up their mind. They would like something that uh, stays in tune, but they don't have to go through the learning curve of this over here. Maybe they don't want to uh, get another guitar that has that type of apparatus on it, or maybe uh, drill out their you know, route it out further and this type of thing. You know, you always go through these things of, well, what if I don't like it once I have my guitar, my favorite guitar drilled out and routed out and all this stuff. Maybe it'll change the tone and all this type of stuff. So this allows you to string it up like normal. And you'll see up here there's uh, two rows of roller nuts on this. Trev Wilkinson makes this especially for us, this double roller nut, and it has six individuals uh, steel hardened bearings in the front and six in the back. The six in the back are to allow you to get rid of the string trees. The six in the front is to take out the friction when you push down on the whammy bar because there's friction there and a lot of times it never quite comes back to where it originally was. You know, so you're out of tune again, right? Uh, another thing that can be a problem, some of you guys change strings, that's why I hand out strings. <laughs> get rid of the ones with all the cheesecake on it. But the, the string post itself, you take off the string, and maybe you have a 12, 15-year-old guitar, and it can feel like a four-year-old's loose tooth. Well, that's not going to come back in tune either, because you might have 800 pounds of pull or whatever it is on it, and you push down on it, come back, and maybe it goes, watch this, guys. The shift's over the other. <laughs> Another problem can be in the, with the string post as well, this being the string post, uh, it's not unusual to have three wraps or uniform winds around it. Maybe you get down to the D and the low E string, which are also coiled, which make it even worse. And you push down the whammy bar and they tend to do this. And they jump over each other. And you let go and they don't go back this way. They stay like this. And of course, you're not going to come back in tune either. Or the string trees, too. So there's a lot of elements up here to keep a guitar from coming back in tune. To watch this one not come back in the tune. <laughs> and then, uh, only one did I bring here tonight. I usually only bring a guitar that is just about to be released and uh, kind of play share and tell with it with a sneak preview on something. But everything else I always play that, that belongs to the store. So on this guitar, I'll do some, some swells with chords and hopefully you can. Uh, here it come back in tune. Can I go over the lock? The oh yeah. So it <coughs> locks. It locks actually in the string post and there's six individual <coughs> thumb wheels back here. If you'll notice that there's no there's no winds around the string post, there's a quarter to a half wind. <laughs> right. So you string it up like normal, put it over the first roller and under the second, and then pull it up tight here like this. Just lock it in. And by the time, even with stretching, by the time you get a quarter to a half a line, you're all the way up in tune and you're back in action. And if you've ever had a, a, a locking trim system, you better have a spare guitar because uh, you're going to be spending the next 20 minutes. Yes? Uh, you're recommending, in other words, that you don't have to put wines. You don't have to have a lot of wines on, on your peg. There's no wines at all. Okay, because I, I just bought a Strat Plus Deluxe. And I have found that if I don't put a few wines on it, I, I play pretty hard at times, and I have sometimes I, I do cause it to go out of, out of tune because of the pressure I'm putting from vents huh. when I don't put the wines on it. Really? Yeah. That doesn't make sense. I disagree with. <laughs> I have no well, I think I had a guitar. And I did the same thing you did. I started with a lot of wraps, 
Uh, I just started. I started with no raps at all. As right, I started with no raps, then I went to a lot of raps, and I and I eventually found out that it's best without the raps. Just put it straight in. Just put it straight in. Tighten it up. Chop the string off. You might have to stretch it out a little bit, but uh, the whole idea is no raps, right? Yeah, it works. Better. Unless uh, one of the uh, unless maybe one of the rollers is freezing on you and not turning, and that could be. Uh, there are some ways of, of, of remedying that. Uh, some people have taken a slight little um, awl, or, you know, something like that, and, and just put there and just a punch and just, I mean, very lightly with a mallet, tap it, and, uh, and freeze it up. And I've tried it on, on one that I own and, and it worked, and it just happened to have frozen up. of a locking trim system over here like a, a Floyd Rose design because there's guys that are, are really into that and they made a fine art of playing it but it, it does address a lot of people that have never made up their mind didn't want to go through uh, snipping the ball ends off and, and all these other things and the Floyd Rose is a, a great design too but the idea is some people like chocolate some people like chocolate chip some people can't stand chocolate chip and they like strawberry you know so uh, the tastes of a guitarist are so eclectic and varied. Uh, that's why you have so many models and, and so many uh, types of guitar strings, you know, uh, gauges and, and things like that, and amplifiers and mixing and matching and volume. And if that is enough, then you start adding on lots of pedals and <coughs> yeah, and all that type of stuff. So far, um, okay, we've covered the strap plus. Let me see what. Yeah. This is a kind of a cha slightly changed version of a Herbie Hancock tune called Watermelon Man. Oh. No, it's not. <laughs> That's the next one. I'll play two in a row. Um, Thank <laughs> you. 
the seven and a quarter, like on a vintage. And it's got jumbo frets, 22 of them. So it's it fits in this slot over here. And if, it, if that's what scratches your itch, which it did me, um, it, it's, it's something that we've never, we have not come up with before. And it, it's a real nice combination. Pearl dot inlays. Uh, standard Stratocaster pickups with, with a, a, a DiMarzio humbucker splits, so you can go humbucker or single coil. The new Kaler slash Floyd Rose designed uh, locking trim system, it's, it's uh, the new Steeler, which is it's a much heavier duty type of system. And a vintage type of body, but with a bevel here so you can get in up for high plane. And this thing rips because I you get the all the vintage type of stratocaster tones. Because this pickup is back under its uh, original point where instead of with the twenty four frets where you're pushing the pickups together and, and, and getting a different sound yet. More modern sound. This has more of a vintage sound when you get to the single coils. <laughs> And you get to the back. Uh, to answer that, 
basically all along the fender has, has been changing their their neck shapes. Chevy changes the cars each year and this type of thing. With the uh, the old guitars, going back to the earliest, the Broadcaster, you had a different shape yet. This is what we call these days the big old uh, baseball bat neck. Baseball bat in a good way. And it was a big neck, big old neck, and, and it really resounded, uh, really alive type of thing. It wasn't like strumming, you didn't feel anything in it. And then 55, 56, there was a very slight V. 57 got to be a real sharp V. Then by the time we got to 59, 60, it was an oval. Pretty big oval with that, uh, kind of a wide oval, and then uh, by the it went through a couple slight areas in in, uh, in the rest of the 60s, like 67, 68, and then all of a sudden you got to 68, 69, and it got to what what some people call the old pencil neck, real narrow and real shallow, real little itty bitty neck, and. So Fender actually has, I'm going to kill two birds with one stone with, the, with this question. Fender has the old patterns of the, of the uh, major time periods in the custom shop. And Fender has a custom shop that you can actually have a guitar made exactly the way you want it. You might be saying, you know, I have a 6 string strap that I should have never sold. I mean, who's ever said that, right? Here we go over and over. I had this 1950 frozen to death guitar, and I wish I'd never sold it. You know. So, uh, if you ordered something like that from the custom shop, they have that particular time period and neck. They have uh, old vintage, the old vintage color formulations from the old Duco Dupont uh, uh, things. That they they have literally the paint formulations that you could have literally uh, cloned a new guitar of, of what you'd sold. Maybe it was an old uh, Inca Silver or Aztec Gold or Shoreline Gold or Sherwood Green or Charcoal Frost Metallic. I mean, there's a zillion colors that we haven't reissued. Not a zillion, maybe about a one and a half dozen of them. But we've never reissued. Well, they have those old paint formulations. They could literally get you that guitar. Or maybe you might say, you know, I want this color exactly right there. Uh, they will match it. You send in you know, a swatch of something. Maybe it's it's off of a piece of clothing or whatever, uh, or a piece of paper. They can match that and make you a guitar that way. Uh, uh, they can put in humbuckings. Uh, they can scallop it out. They can uh, make it with a tele headstock. And uh, on a strap body or a strap with a uh, telly with a strap headstock, they can do all these variations that you want, and you have basically a one-off type of thing, and uh, completely handmade, and you'd have the dream guitar that you kind of designed for five hundred dollars. <laughs> you can't have it off the line for five hundred dollars. <laughs> so, one more uh, quick question. Uh, Somebody was playing my guitar one time and uh, brought up this interesting point that I really know nothing about, and you're probably the guy to ask me. Uh, I really agree with him with the guitar when he said this to me because it really kind of knocked me off my feet. He said that the inlay in the back of my neck, which happens to be a different color, it looks like uh, maybe rosewood or something like that, it's maple neck. Uh, he says to me that uh, they didn't start doing that until after uh, Fender sold the company to CBS. In other words, saying that my guitar wasn't a 57. Uh, I mean, you could see the crazy cracks and everything to finish. I really wanted to club with the guitar, but uh, I was a little more polite. Prove them wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, like, did they always do that? For Tell me, does it have a, does it start with a V on, on your, on your serial number? Uh, no. Okay, good. No, zero, two, two, something. Well, okay, if it starts with a V, it's a vintage reissue. Strat. Of course, it could be an older custom shop one. I don't know. Um, the best way, the most definitive way, is on the to end of the neck, right? on the end of the neck, and if it's under the lacquer. It's written in pencil, 157. January 57, yeah. In the body, 
Uh, by 57, they were doing it in the middle neck uh, cavity, uh, a pickup cavity, the middle one. It should have a number there. This or it might have, yeah, under the springs here, but it'll be written in pencil, too. Do they always have that inlay in the back, though, in different color? Wood? Not always, but uh, depending on, on, on the year and everything. 57, yeah, 57 had it. And uh, nowadays we're doing it with, with uh, this is walnut. This is rosewood. Okay, um, any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Stratocaster himself, you locked him. Um, I've heard a lot of people say that the, the waste sensor strap that he's using has some kind of a preamp in it. Is that true? Is it a fender preamp or something he just had put in? Next question. No. <laughs> you know yes, that? yes it is. It's, it's got a, a, do we have one here? No. I can talk that one down. Eric's using it. Oh. <laughs> okay, uh, to address that, um, we, we do have some vintage, uh, some, some uh, artists that have been doing signature series guitars for us. It kind of worked into that. When, when this seemed to really present itself, uh, Clapton had been using Blackie for about 12, 15 years before. Uh, he came to Fender and asked if we'd make him another guitar. And Dan Smith, who happens to head up the, the guitar lines, uh, proposed to him, maybe we could have a vintage, uh, a, uh, a signature series model guitar for him. Obviously, he didn't need any more money, so it wasn't out of money, or he didn't need to get any better known either. Right. So, uh, he's been... The only thing I've ever seen him in doors besides Fender is, is Guild on acoustic guitars. And so, and well, <laughs> we'll stick to guitars. Uh, we, you know, he, he isn't with, like, uh, he hasn't bounced around from company to company. He knows what he wants, and, and what Eric wants, Eric gets. And uh, so it, it was quite a compliment more to us than actually to him, I feel. Uh, so he kind of had carte blanche to do whatever he wanted, and we wanted him to decide on what his dream guitar was. And that's how it led up to the, the specs on the clapping guitar. And man, he went through different necks, and it, it got held up. It was released two years too, uh, not too late, but two years later than, than the first showing of it at the January NAMM show. I can't even remember what year that was. You remember, Larry? 86, 87. The first time shown? 87, I think. 87? Yeah. Well, what we wanted to do was have him have enough fishing line that he could do whatever he wanted and decide and experiment and then finally come down to the thing where forever hold your peace, right? Because it would be hard to try to press somebody like that into something and then then they kind of decide later. I, I fall into the same thing. Custom shop said, well, make anything you want. And you think you know what you want, and you write it all down and you go, but you know, maybe I could do this too. Gosh, this would be nice too. But it's, it's, it's one guitar though. You know? So it's like you have one wish. So. With Eric Clapton, he went with a real sharp V-neck. It's sharper than his 57 Blackie. And then he wanted it softened up. And then he wanted the front radius changed. And then he wanted uh, a 20-second fret added. And then we had this little switch down here. He decided he wanted active all the time. It would either put the, the active, uh, the, the mid-boost on or off. And actually, I have one of the first 12 in that that way where it has a little switch and 21 frets and lacquer and all this stuff. So there are some perks. So that went under the bed immediately. Yeah. That was another investment, right? Sorry? Another investment, right? Another investment. They gave it opportunity. Right. <laughs> so Eric kept changing his mind, and then he'd go out on, on the road. 
it wasn't like he changed it a whole bunch of times, but he, he'd settle in on something, then go out on the road, and he has this policy. He'll, he'll go hit the road for six, nine months, and you can't bother him while he's doing that. And when he gets off, he doesn't, for the next three months, he goes on the hideous and decides he does not want to talk about anything about music and doesn't even pick up a guitar, you know. He's completely on, on, on holiday, so to speak. And so, I mean, that hangs it up another year right there. And then it's, oh, yes, let's see, where were we at on that? You know? It goes, well, I was thinking, I'd like this change. Well, then you have to get an amendment to the contract uh, otherwise, just so that there's no miscommunication or anything, and then him initial it or sign it. And that's what happened. But the reason we were going to these painstaking uh, degrees is because we noticed just before we were putting ours out that there was other people doing vintage, uh, not vintage, where am I keep saying that? Uh, signature series models, but the, the problem was you'd see the picture of the artist playing, and you'd look at the, the thing that bears their name on the headstock, and you'd go, gosh, that's kind of vaguely resembling it. You know, what is this one? The, the hot rotted version because he wouldn't touch this one that has his name on it. You know, so we wanted exactly what you grab off the wall being as exactly what the guy's playing on stage. And I've played his, his real ones, and I've played, and I own two Clapton's, and they were exactly the same. So there, there's been no alterations or secret things thrown in it or whatever. But what it is, it looks normal, like a mild-mannered Strat guitar, except it looks a little more like this with the lace sensors. Now, it's active, but not because of the lace sensor technology. It's, it's active because of a mid-boost, active mid-boost, which is, is routed out and placed under the pick guard here. And because there's so many good guitarists, seasoned guitarists, that, that work at Fender in high places, uh, we knew better not to put a 9-volt battery under here because you have to go bend it back and try to get in your 9-volt battery because it's pooping out in between, you know, on your set. It's back here, right here, and it clips in right behind these six screws and just barely clears the spring. So it works out great. And all the way back on the tone control, this one here, gives you a strap tone. And as you dial it clockwise, you get a much thicker and a much higher output, about 20 dB boost. <coughs> Eric calls it his compressor. It's not a compressor, actually. It, it just stomps on the whole front end of his amp and, and uh, turns it to 11, you know. Yeah, and, and you can see him on, on some videos and actually concert footage. Um, the reason he wanted to do that was because he got tired of changing gu guitars and he doesn't like pedals on the floor, even though he has plenty of room on stage. So he wanted to be able to go from lay down Sally type of tones to cream, just turning this to going up and everywhere in between. So it sounds more like a, an SG through a stack. I mean, it, yeah, it's a little preamp, but it's it's uh, it's a mid boost, so it's boosting those frequencies rather than just a, an overall volume boost. No. <coughs> okay, so with the HRR got all these nice features. The reason Fender is, is, is just coming out with this is because there's a lot of rock and roll artists we've noticed that are going from like real ultra modern shapes and rediscovering their love for, for vintage looking instruments. And it's more like of a hot rotted looking traditional Fender. So you can get this one in, in, in sunburst and, and this is sonic blue and old vintage color. And some you know some other colors as well. Uh, it has a crazy amount of versatility to it. And this M80 amplifier, I can go from clean to super nasty, dirty, you know, channel switching. This will give you an idea here. Uh, 
clockwise, it has quite a dip in the mid-range and lots of highs and lots of lows. As you go counterclockwise, that dip flattens out and then re reverses itself to uh, quite a bump in the mid-range to this side. For more than the squawking type of tone. which I think makes it really shine because it gives you all that sluggy in the gut, low end. And uh, I, I've seen guys that buy this kind of configuration where they don't just buy the head and the bottom, they'll buy the combo on the bottom. So that way they can practice in their bedroom or low. Or when they go out and play the gig, they, they take the whole thing along. And what you have is you come up with something like this. Actually, exactly like this. <laughs>
Okay. Now, I didn't come up with those names, but the rad, hot, and jam. And uh, the rad, hey, we don't have all these plugged in. I can't, I mean, I'm running out of time and stuff. But I'll, I'll just review them real quickly with you. You have uh, <coughs> 20 watts in this one with an 8-inch speaker ported and closed back so you can get a little more low end. It's got a four push button control that gives you kind of more of a Walkman type of approach where you have pre-selected tones, but then you have this con same contour control as over here where it really radically changes it. So you actually have a lot more of the four type of pre-selects with that. And then you have, um, you can plug in here with your, your Walkman or, or CD disc playing along with it. So you hear it in there or with your headphones. Some people say, well, why don't you just plug it in here? The thing is, if you're playing a distorted guitar, you don't want your music to sound like a kazoo. <laughs> <laughs> so you get the music in clean, and you're mixing in the guitar distorted with it. Next one up is the hot. This is 25 watts, a 10-inch speaker. Same, same front end, except you have reverb added. And then we have the jam that is 25 watts as well, but with a 12 inch speaker, the same preamp, we have reverb and chorus added.
And uh, George comes in and he goes, oh, God, George, you got to sit down and try this thing. you got to play this thing. Well, he was in a hurry, and so finally he got, he says, George, sit down. Pulled out a chord. He says, no, I know what type of, you know, all this stuff. When you like, grab a guitar, sat him down, and he plugged in. He played for 45 minutes. Then turned the thing off, rolled it up, put that up on the, on the, on the counter, too. He wanted to buy that as well, and, and left with it. And uh, there's a lot of people discovering these amps, and they're great. This is the, the power core is 65 watts a side, two 12 inch speakers. And stereo chorus.
What do you think? I don't know. You guys want to run, or do we got time for? Uh, Let me show that one on. for something that's one. really not vintage. <laughs> Now, I think this is in tune. So we shift in tune. This is an interesting guitar that Larry brought out to me last second. Fender is doing some guitars without the Fender name on it, and some of them have shown up with the De Cuisto name. Some have shown up with the Kubicki name, the great Kubicki basses, like that Stu Ham's been using, the Joe Satriani. Fender makes those in the custom shop, and Philip Kubicki designed it, and he wanted to get back into designing and out of manufacturing and do back, get back into what he, he loves doing, that's design guitars and basses. And uh, also a series of guitars called Heartfields. This happens to be the RR9. Guess what RR is for? Both kinds of music, rock and roll. This has a full 25 and a half inch scale length and a 12 inch uh, fret radius and uh, 22 frets. It too has locking tuners uh, made by Goto and, and they work really well. Now you probably look at those and you go, ah, LEDs. I like LEDs. They're so cool. <laughs> <laughs> what do they do? Now what do they do, right? Well, what this does is it has three presets that you can use it with. Uh, the first one is clean, out of phase strap type of tone. Next is, is clean, humbucking tone. You know, you might look at one humbucking and go, well, one humbucking, what can I do with that? Listen to how drastic I can change the sounds in this. And then the third is an overdrive, humbucking with built-in overdrive. In here. And back here, car battery. <laughs> <laughs> car battery. <laughs> Actually, you hook it up with the two. <laughs> Behind here, uh, there's a, a little rubber piece that goes over this, and behind it, here's where the battery goes. And there's there's three little screws back here that use a little tiny screwdriver. One is for the volume of this pickup. The next is for the tone and how much gain you want on it. So the first one. <laughs>